Hello. All six of us, seven of us, including Eric, that made it tonight. They'll trickle in. It always happens. The nicer the weather it is, the more they want to stay outside, and so they got to be outside with kids. And you guys are like, kids, bye. <laughs> I understand. Every one of you, yeah, 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 that's about right. It's like, ha, ha, have fun. So let us, as always, begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we give you praise and thanksgiving for this evening, for this opportunity to gather once again in your name, to continue to grow in our understanding of you, of your love for us, and to continue to grow deeper in our faith and understanding. We pray that you may bless our time together, that you may bless our conversation, that you may help it to be fruitful, that we may truly embrace it and bear witness for your greater glory. We ask all these things in your Son's name as we pray together in the words that our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, this is our last adult class. I'm a little sad, but also it's like, I get my Wednesdays back, but I really don't because the reason this is the last class and your kids have two more classes is because next week during class, um, I will have the First Communion kids in here and we'll be going through how to go to First Communion. And then the following Wednesday, the last day of class, uh, the kids are actually having a pizza party. We're, we're getting pizza brought in. We're having a snow cone stand come in. Um, and so the kids will be doing that. And instead of us coming and being in class, I'm actually having a meeting with our Spanish-speaking parishioners um, because, as I told them last night, uh, I was just given permission last week to begin process of starting a Mass in Spanish on the weekends. Um, but before we start that, I have to get a lot of things in place like, okay, um, music. What are we going to use? Because obviously we can't use the hymnals we have. Do we use Floricanto as most parishes do? Do we do our own thing? What mass parts do we want to do? Do we want to do a cappella? Do we want to do piano? Do we want to do organ? Do we want to do guitar? Who's going to lead it? Who's going to help translate? Who's going to be our lectors? Who's going to be our servers? Who's going to be our Eucharistic ministers? Who's going to be our ushers? Because I can't do all those things. Um, so having that meeting with the community um, as we kind of continue to grow. Um, the initial plan uh, for that Mass, for those who may be interested, uh, it's going to be Saturday nights at 7 p.m. Um, one of the things that I found in my short time being a priest, I keep saying that, but it's been almost eight years at this point, um, I, I like to downplay that as a defense mechanism. I've only been a priest for 35 years. I mean, it's going to be that at some point. But in my first eight years, um, that I've noticed is many times the non-English language mass is always the last mass of the weekend. It's not fair. Um, how do we include everyone in the community in the body of Christ? And so my last parish, actually, we, uh, at Corpus Christi, we'd actually canceled a mass at the main parish, the Saturday evening mass at five, to start one at the mission in Spanish, because the mass was only about 25, 30 people on Saturday night, Whereas the Spanish community, when we started, was 85 people. It's like, oh, how do we? And by the time I left, we had about 150 people coming to the Mass in Spanish at the Mission Parish <laughs> um, on Saturdays at 5. And so the hope is, um, as we continue to grow our um, community here, both in English and in Spanish, to be able to um, catechize and evangelize everybody. I, I was telling some of our parishioners, like, man, if I, if I spoke, spoke Filipino, or if I spoke Vietnamese, or German, I'd greatly offer it, but I fake my way through Spanish, and my grammar and English is definitely my worst. So, you get what you get. Um, but also, um, I want to see it as an alternative to the Mass in Clinton. Um, through the, the studies that I've done, um, kind of preparing my proposal to the Archbishop, I didn't realize... The only church west of El Reno on I-40 that has a Mass in Spanish is Clinton. So basically, if you're west of El Reno and you want to go to Mass in Spanish, you're either going to the city, El Reno area, or you're coming all the way out to Clinton. 
Um, and then there's nothing again until you hit Texas. <laughs> so um, I'm passable in Spanish. Um, I can fake it. Um, and so we'll uh, do the best we can with that, but also seeing it as an alternative. Because um, uh, in Clinton, they've got the Mass in Spanish at 1 o'clock on Sundays, so we'll have it 7 o'clock in the evening here. A, as an alternative. B, I'm exhausted on Sundays after two Masses. <laughs> if you want me to do three Masses on Sunday, at that point, I have no energy whatsoever. And that's part of the struggle that I have personally with putting the other language Mass as the last one. That means you just get whatever's left over. That's not fair to anybody. Um, so now the 1030 gets what's left over. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, but having two on Saturday, resting up two on Sunday, um, I think will be beneficial for the community, um, but also will help me um, make sure that I can give my best um, to all four of the masses. And Deacon even gets to try and learn some Spanish. Bueno. It's going to be awesome. No. Um, <laughs> he's like, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, it's muy fácil, muy fácil, very easy. Um, now, so, so that's one of the, some of the things we're working on um, a, as we go through. And a lot of it, um, for me, um, comes from the lesson that I learned from the gospel that we read for Mass today. And so I want to start off our class this evening with that gospel. <clears throat> and it's from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. That very day, the first day of the week, Two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were, preventing, were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? They said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see." And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that, while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us? while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us. So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So why would I bring up the gospel of the disciples on the road to Emmaus? I think it's a great way for us to really focus at, on as we come to the end of our academic year, as we come to kind of this new um, going into summer phase, because it shows us how we, as baptized Catholics and Christians, are called to evangelize. Did you notice what Jesus did do 
and what Jesus did not do when he came upon these two disciples on the road on the way to Emmaus. One of the hardest things for us to do as Catholics and Christians when we come to non-believers, when we come to Christians that aren't Catholic, is to not ask questions. Well, why are you doing this? Well, why are you doing that? Well, you're wrong with this. We see this a lot amongst different denominations in the Christian church, that instead of trying to see what it is we share in common, we begin to proselytize. We begin to preach at people and say, you're wrong because of this. You're wrong because of that. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? We begin to push people or pull people along with us. But that's not what Jesus did in the gospel. What did he do? He accompanied them. He walked with them. He met them where they were and walked by their side as he opened to them the scriptures. Yes, there's a way to preach to people that you aren't preaching at them. But instead, you're inviting them into that conversation, into that dialogue. And that's how we're called to evangelize, not by saying, I'm right and you're wrong, get it right, because that rarely works with any of us. We typically put up our defense mechanisms, or we see this amongst our brothers and sisters sometimes when we have disagreements. It's easier to say, well, you're just stupid. Well, you're a moron. Why don't you get it? But when we say that, is that inviting them to go deeper in their faith? Or is that instead inviting them to build up a wall? Inviting them to block us out? And then how do we feel when we're attacked as well? Rarely when we are asked questions about our faith from non-Catholics, do we respond well? Does anybody respond well when we're asked by non-Catholics about the Catholic faith? Typically, we, we already have our answers in line. I'm just a Catholic. I don't know why we do the things we do. Ask Father. Like, like that's the typical answer when I, oh, Father, I'm so glad you're here. Come here real quick. Hey, how's it going? We've got questions. Of course you do. But also, we struggle to truly understand the why. And if you've got nothing else from these classes that we've had on Wednesday nights, that's my hope is that you've begun to ask yourself the question of why do we do what we do? Because once we get behind the answer of the why, the what makes so much more sense. So when we look at how we evangelize, there's ways that are beneficial and there's ways that are not beneficial. One of the best ways in the last five or six years has been on social media. Some people have done it well, some people have not done it well. An example of good catechesis and good evangelization on social media. You guys all know the names I'm about to say. Father, and then Bishop Barron. Most Catholics, and even Christians that aren't Catholics, have heard the name Father Barron, or Bishop Barron. Why? Because he brought Catholicism alive. He had this whole series called Catholicism. And then he became a, an auxiliary bishop in Los Angeles, which gave him access to all of these funds to be able to continue to produce these things. But also, you know the name of this priest I'm about to say too, A, because I talk about him, but B, because if you've been on any social media platform in the last five years, you've probably seen one of his clips, Father Mike Schmidt. We've all heard his name. You've got, the gospel, you've got the Bible in a year timeline. You've got the catechism in a year timeline. And to think, this is year three of the Bible in a year. Year one of catechism in a year. That pre-COVID, all he did was have three to five minute videos answering a lot of the big questions in the faith. But also, there are things like we have our Catholic radio station here from the parish. From here until about halfway to Sayre, 100.7 picks up our Catholic radio station that's done out of the laundry room in our kitchen, because that's what we have right now. We're going to get bigger, don't worry. And then going to the east, um, about Foss Lake is where it begins to cut out. But at that point, 98.3 from Clinton picks up with the Catholic radio station. So we have a little bit of Catholic radio here in western Oklahoma. In Oklahoma City, 97.3 is the large branch, KKNG, of the Oklahoma Catholic Radio. Why is that relevant? Because one of the things that social media tries to do 
is try to engage people where they are. Where do you go for social media? Where you feel accepted. Where you feel like you don't have to really put in a bunch of effort. <clears throat> where you can go to, quite literally, waste time. I mean, how much time do we spend on our social media in a week, let alone every day? Sometimes I can get on Facebook Reels and watch cat videos for hours on end, and it's like, oh, man, should have really been working on my homily today. Lord, need your help today. That, that rarely happens, but it, 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 because at that point, it's Saturday at 3.30, and I'm in a confessional for an hour, so I can at least work on it during that time. But that rarely happens in that specific way. But how many times do we watch things that really don't teach us anything, but we just like to, to have as fun? I mean, Sunday nights growing up, we would always pray the family rosary, and after the family rosary, we would always turn on ABC. Why? America's Funniest Home Videos was on. It was nonsense. We all got mad at Bob Saget because they always picked the wrong video as the winner. And we always thought that, man, if I just made the best video, if they could actually just video my life, I could win that $100,000. I could win that million dollars at the end of the year. I could do it because I am that goofy. And that's kind of how we feel sometimes when we look at those things. But it doesn't challenge us when we go to things like that. And so many times, that's when we go to blogs, that's when we go to um, news sites, that's when we go to things where we respect the opinion of people who are telling us things. The problem, though, is, and I had this conversation with some of my priest brethren a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the new synod on synodality, the problem, though, is blogs and news sites are coming at things from an angle, no matter which side of the aisle you're on. Very rarely is anything truly fair and balanced. Yes, I purposely use that phrase. Because nothing is fair and balanced in any sort of media. That it's always going to come at it from a specific angle. So for me, as a Catholic, what angle is it that is the best for us to approach these things from, if not from the lens of the love of God? How is it that he's showing us to live? And so what does he tell us in the gospel? Well, again, in that road to Emmaus, he's not telling us to preach down people's throat. He's not telling us to make people conform to our way. What he's telling us is to do the loving thing and meet people where they are, which is sometimes the hardest thing for us as Catholics and Christians to do. Because some people are in some pretty messy situations. In fact, I was talking with someone after Mass this morning, and I was talking about how there's really kind of three different levels of looking at issues. There's the national, like the national pride way of looking at something. Well, I'm an American, so I have this stance, because if you're an American, you have to have this stance. There's the national way of looking at something. There's the political way of looking at something. Well, my political party says this, therefore I believe this. The problem, though, yet again, just like with blogs, is that many times they have an agenda behind them. The spiritual, though, tries to be as impartial as possible, except that it's partial to love. And so we were talking specifically about immigration, um, that um, how do we look at it nationally, how do we look at it politically, and how do we look at it spiritually? Well, nationally, there's really two sides of the fence. And yes, I used that purposely. Because you're either for a wall to keep people out, or you're against a wall and let everybody come in. Like, those are the typical traditional sides. Politically, it's the, if you're going to come here, we want you to do it the right way. That if you are here illegally, you have now become an illegal person. That's the terminology that's used. Spiritually takes all of that jargon out and says, no matter who is in front of me, how do I love you as my neighbor? That's hard for us. That's hard for people that are staunch political people, that are staunch 
national people, no matter which side of the argument you're on, it's hard for us to look at people that we don't agree with and say, how can I love you today? Instead of, how can I love you today? I'll love you right to, right to where I want you to be. But it's not really loving anybody. And that's one of the things that we get from Christ that is so countercultural. He loves you so much that no matter what side of any argument you're on, his love for you will never change. Think about that for a second. No matter what you have done, and this was one of the circumstances that the person brought up after Mass today, was that, I um, can't remember the specifics, but say you come into, into contact with an abuse victim and the abuser. How are we called to look at each person? Through the eyes of love. One of them, it's a whole lot easier to have love for. It's easy for us to side with the victim because they've been victimized. It's easy for us to look at Christ and say, man, I, I, I'm there with you, man. I, I've had punishment in my life. I've had downfalls in my life. And yeah, it sucks. I've been persecuted. This is horrible. It's hard, though, to have the same response from the victim that Christ did in that situation. Because typically when we are a victim, we have a victim's response. Like so much so that we've categorized it in a certain way. But what is Christ, the victim, what is his response? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. <laughs> I would love to say that that is my response every time. I'll confess out loud, on camera, I don't always have that action. I don't always have those words in the midst of it. And it was interesting, I went to my dentist on Sunday, or on Monday, um, and he, out of the blue, um, asked, so confession, Father, tell me about this. Tell me about confession. Have you ever heard, like, confessions that have just thrown you for a loop? It's like, Doc, I've been a priest for almost eight years. Nothing that you can say is going to shock me at this point. My role in the confessional, and I say this all the time because I mean it, my role in the confessional is not to get shocked, is not to get enraged, not to be horrified, is not to be scandalized. My role in the confessional is to say, I'm sorry you went through that, whether you were the abuser or the abused. How can I help you be loved today? How can I dispense to you God's mercy today? I said, how do you do that? I said, honestly, the grace of God. I'm not using that as a cop-out, it's a real, because I've heard some very egregious things that you'd be like, oh my gosh, how, how did you see that person, Father? It's like, well, sometimes it's behind the screen, so I don't see the people. But also, I see my woundedness in that person. Some of the most uplifting confessions I've ever heard are in the prisons. And you might be like, Father, really? Yes. Because when you help someone go from identifying themselves by their sins to recognizing that they have a glimmer of hope and just see that light bulb click on for the first time, it gives me so much affirmation that I am where the Lord has called me to be. Despite my personal flaws, despite my personal weaknesses, despite my idiosync, whatever the words are, despite my oddities, <laughs> that is where I truly understand what it means to be loving from God. I'm not there to judge. I'm there to love. But then how do I take that out of the confessional? Because I do counseling every once in a while, both couples counseling for marriage, sometimes couples counseling after marriage because, well, you're human. But also sometimes people will come to me, hey, Father, I've got a question for you. Okay? Like those are the most feared words that you can have for a priest. Father, I've got a question for you. Because it can be anything from what time is it to what is your stance on or what is the church's stance on? And it's like, okay, no matter how tired I am, how do I push that by the wayside and try and give the most pastoral, theological, well-thought-out, loving answer that I can possibly give. Sometimes I don't have it. 
For instance, um, Katie was going to her search site today, and MSN, one of the top um, articles today, said, I don't understand why people from the church are so anti-Pope Francis. I mean, Pope Benedict took the doctrine and dogma of limbo and canceled it. My response, I wanted to say, tell me you don't know the Catholic faith without telling me you don't know the Catholic faith. Like, like you know, that, that sarcastic answer sometimes that we give? Tell me you don't know about this without actually telling me you don't know about this. So I was like, <clears throat> limbo has never officially been taught by the church. Limbo did not exist. It was posited in the fourth century by Augustine as a question of what happens to the unbaptized, what happens to the infants that don't have the ability to be baptized. It was posited but never defined, never made doctrine, never made something you have to believe or even that you should believe. But it was the main thing on the religious section for MSN today. And it's like, what? What? And that's the struggle sometimes when we go to blogs or go to those political places from one view or from another is that anytime someone says anything, some people are actually going to believe them. When we look at the church, how many people, how many times did we ourselves believe something someone said about the church that isn't actually true? I fall into that trap a lot. It's like, will you believe what this priest or this bishop said the church teaches? It's like, yeah, we don't teach that. But this priest said it. It's like, that doesn't make it gospel. I I don't know what to, he's human, he's flawed. I I don't know what to say. Like, I was telling Deacon this weekend, every time that I do the Triduum, I learn more about how to celebrate the Triduum. Because in the Missal, there's the old saying, you say the black, you do the red. The red are the instructions of this is how and why and where you're supposed to do things. Every year I find something completely new. It's like, huh, I've been doing that wrong this whole time. Like, for instance, on Good Friday, typically what we had done before this year was we would have the cross covered. And we would stop at the front of the church, say the wood of the cross, stop in the middle, the wood of the cross. And and each time we take a little bit off of the cross, right? Right? And we get up here, and by the time it's up here, you take all of the um, covering off the cross. That's not an official option. It's like, wait, what do you mean that's not an official option? I grew up with that. Well, let me go and read what the primary text says. The primary text give us two options. Option number one, you carry the cross in uncovered and stop three different times and say the wood of the cross. Or you carry the cross in covered all the way to the front of the church, say the word of the cross, take off the top, word of the cross, take off the side, word of the cross, take off the other side, and then put it in. It's like, huh. We combined them. And I didn't even know it. How did I... This is how I grew up doing it. And that's sometimes why when there's changes that are happening in the liturgy, they're happening, is because I realize I've been doing this wrong the whole time. For instance... Did you notice Ash Wednesday, there was no water in the holy water font? Anybody notice that? And that by the weekend there was. Did you notice that? (laughs) Because traditionally, I was always told, Lent, you take all of the holy water out. Because you're in the desert. It's dryness and you have a longing and a desire to be able to receive the sacramentals for the first time at Easter. Well, we got a letter on Thursday, right after Ash Wednesday, saying, yeah, that's not a thing. What do you mean it's not a thing? Like, they used to put sand in the holy water font growing up, and they put, like, cactuses in it, and what do you mean that's not a thing? Yeah, that's not a thing. What? And then I found out Holy Thursday at 11.55 at night, so it's too late to make a decision. There is a 48-hour period every single year where you're supposed to drain the holy water font. Did you know that? From midnight Holy Thursday until the Easter Vigil, there's supposed to be no water in the holy water font. It's like, huh, I've missed that the last eight years. And you may ask yourself, well, why would that be? If you can't do it all of Lent, why do you have to do it for those two days? 
Because what is the first thing you do after the homily for the Easter vigil? You go to the holy water font and you bless the water. Why would you bless water that's already blessed? It makes sense when you think about it. The problem though is like, I just didn't have the time to think about that beforehand. So next year from Holy Thursday to Holy Saturday, we probably won't have water in the holy water font because Father's learning things. And I give those small examples to show ways that I'm still in the midst of this learning different things of the why. Sometimes we'll add in um, different opportunities of um, how do we express the liturgy. For instance, during Lent, did you notice how we, in a very slight way, try to make it a more docile um, experience of the liturgy? What was different during Lent than from ordinary time? Well, we changed the mass parts. You probably noticed that because you're like, I have no clue what's being sung here, Father. Well, I learned the Sanctus for the first time when I joined seminary. I'd never heard it before. And it's like, this is the thing? It's like, yeah, they did it for 1,900 years. Oh, yeah, my bad. <laughs> I didn't grow up with Latin. And so we sang the Sanctus. But then we also sang the Agnus Dei. Well, I grew up with that one. Like, that's one that, like, growing up on military bases, everybody knows the Agnus Dei. Agnus Dei, qui tolis peccatamut. Everybody knew that one. And then I remember learning for the first time, even with Easter, it's a little bit different because everything's a little bit more jubilant. We've got more flowers. We've got deacon chanting at the end of Mass. Go in peace, hallelujah. That was way too high. Don't do that. But don't, don't follow follow's example. Always wrong now. Um, but, but we have different seasons to replicate the way that we have different seasons in life. That during Lent, there's no flowers. Why? Because it's not really a time to rejoice. It's a time for us to go deeper into prayer, fast, and almsgiving. Did you know there's another season every year where we're meant to be a little bit more docile? Do you know what it is? It's another season of preparation. Another season where we wear the rose vestment once. Advent, yes. Why? Because Advent prepares us for the birth of Christ. Lent rep- prepares us for Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. That while we are preparing, we shouldn't be all flashy. And so typically they are more docile when it comes musically, when it comes to um, flowers, when it comes to how we decorate. And there's a reason behind it because well, there's sometimes in life that we don't need to have all the frills. Like even priests typically have like different things that they wear at different times. Now for me, you get what you get. But for, for, for good priests, every once in a while they'll, they'll wear a cassock. Sometimes they'll wear a beretta. Not this beretta, but this beretta. Not the gun, but the hat. Mm. Yeah, the horrible, I know. But th- th- that there's actually a time where a lot of priests will actually wear the beretta for the liturgy. The priest is the only man that's allowed to wear a hat to church. And even encouraged to do so in some expressions of the liturgy. But only during certain times. Because you'll notice when the bishop wears his mitre, which is the name of his hat, he doesn't wear it all the way through Mass. He doesn't even wear his zucchetto, the beanie. He doesn't even wear his zucchetto all the way through Mass. There's certain times where you do. There's certain times when you don't. There's certain times where the bishop will hold his crozier, and there's certain times when he, when he doesn't. But even with the crozier, did you know there's specific rules for how to hold the crozier? If you are the bishop, the crook is supposed to face outward. I am shepherding them. If you are a server or deacon or priest holding it, that should be facing me and never facing the bishop. Because he's shepherding me, not me shepherding him. But those are small nuances many times that get lost on us because we're like, Father, I'm just trying to make it through without killing my kids today. Um, Did you hear my kid fart? How did you not? I mean, my kid hiccuped or burped or killed the the, the mouse that was around. We don't have any mouse, don't worry. But, But did something. I cannot believe you didn't see that, Father. 
someone came to me after mass uh, or uh, before mass this morning like oh, is the parishioner that fainted at mass on Sunday okay it's like someone fainted at mass on Sunday oh yeah yeah I totally missed that one sorry but, but there's sometimes like we don't see those things because we're so focused. For me, it was the, okay, I've got to make sure to do the blessing, which means I've got to make sure to be like, okay, I say this and I say this. I messed up at the Easter Mass on Sunday. Nobody noticed. After the announcements, what is the first word that's supposed to come out of my mouth? The Lord be with you. What was the first thing that came out of my mouth? Uh, the blessing after deacon said, bow down for the blessing. Why? I looked at the deacon too soon. My bad. <laughs> and at that point, it's like, bow down for the blessing. Yeah. So, so, so in that split second, do I say it? Do I not? Do I say it? Do I not? Good and gracious God. <laughs> it happens sometimes. But those are things that when we become more attuned to the liturgy or to how we live and why we live our lives that begin to bear much fruit. And so when it comes back to how we evangelize, how we catechize, there's a very important nuance to the how we engage it. That it's not about pushing our kids to go to church. It's not about dragging them limb by limb, sometimes by their hair, into church. It's about how do we, outside of church, meet them where they are. Not as a friend, but as a fellow brother or sister in Christ. Now, parents, you guys have a different role in that. You do. You should have a different role than your neighbors around you with your children. Your role until your kids turn 18, and even then after, is something that we have jokingly but seriously called good, healthy, Catholic guilt. That is your role in your children's life. Not to be nagging, but to be instructive. If your kid doesn't want to go to school, do you say, oh, well, my kid doesn't want to go to school, so I'm not going to make him go to school? No. I mean, back in the 40s and 50s, we had truancy officers that you would get in trouble if your kid wasn't in school, right? But what is the number one excuse for kids not coming to Mass? The parents not forcing them to come. But Father, my kids, they'll get so mad at me if I make them go to Mass. All right. Now, I I can say that. I don't have kids myself. I understand that. I got mad at my parents all the time. In fact, I was talking with Katie this afternoon, and ironically, do you know what my rebellious phase was towards my dad? You're going to laugh at this because it makes so much sense in hindsight. I went to church. That was my rebellious phase. I didn't want to be at home. You know how I got out of chores? I went to church three extra times a week. I'd go on Wednesday nights for youth group. I'd go on Thursday nights for Bible study. I'd go for Saturday nights for extra youth group. Because Wednesdays were like from 6 to 7.30, school night. Saturdays, 6 to 10.30, every single Saturday. They're like, what are you doing for four and a half hours? Not chores. <laughs> Not being around you. That was my rebelliousness as a teenager. You're like, Father, bless your heart. <laughs> I understand. But for me, that's where my friends were. Because being a military brat, having been to the same school in third grade and sixth grade, because fourth and fifth grade we were in a different state, and then having a junior high for seventh and eighth grade, and then going to a different high school for ninth, and ninth through 12th grade that was 20 miles away, my consistency was my family and my church. I was joking around that I got to go to one party in high school the night of graduation that was sponsored by the school because my dad was a freshman sophomore counselor. And so he knew about the parties before I did. I'll never forget my third year as a chaplain at Bishop McGinnis, I had a transfer parent come in um, her, her kid was transferring in as a junior or senior and, and was part of the, like, the it crowd. She came in distressed and said, Father, I'm struggling. Well, come on in. That's what I'm here for. What is it that you're struggling with? I didn't know if it was her marriage, if it was relationships, or it was the school. The parents have put together a spring break at the playa. 
and I don't know if I feel comfortable with it. And it's like, a parent that's got morals at a Catholic school? Give me a second. Go on. The parents want the kids to go to this specific place because the first thing that happens when they get off the plane, they're handed a margarita and a lay and said, go have fun, kids. And I don't think my, my 16-year-old daughter should do that. And I said, stick to that. Stick to that. You will get peer pressured beyond belief, not only by your daughter, but by your daughter's friends and by your daughter's parents. You are trying to do the best that you can with what God has given you and your child. Keep them away from drugs. Keep them away from alcohol. If they use drugs and alcohol, how do you lovingly embrace them, though? That's the thing that I think many times we miss as a parent. And that's part of that accompaniment part of a parent that we can learn from Christ as he is the father of the faith that he had with these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He met them like a parent is called to accompany his children. He didn't yell at them. He didn't castigate them. He didn't say, you idiots. Now, he did get close to calling them idiots. Did you notice that? He said, hold on, let me see if I can find it real quick. Oh, how foolish you are. How slow of heart. It's like, ooh. Like, like in Jesus' day, they'd be like, you morons, listen to me. But he did it from a loving place. So how do we then, when our kids are being disobedient, not just to us, but to themselves, how do we meet them with the same sign of love? How many of you guys have teenagers? How many of you guys have, have younger than teenagers? All right, so we'll talk to younger than teenagers, that's everybody. <laughs> and most of you guys have some teenagers as well. The best thing that you can do for your children is first of all, be a loving example. Bring them to church. Father, they don't want to come to church. They don't want to do a lot of other things that you make them do. Why is church the exception? For me growing up, I, and I've learned why, because I am ADHD, I talk about that a lot, because I'm learning more about why I do what I do as I go deeper into what it means for my brain chemistry to function with ADHD. A lot of the, the ways that I learn are not normal. The ways that I process, it's not normal. But that's because of my brain chemistry, there's nothing I can do about it. I got in trouble a lot because I was trying to figure out why. Because I could not physically move anywhere until I got that question answered. I talk about that a lot because our kids are the same way many times. Sometimes they're just being a little snots and like, well, why do I have to do this? Well, because I said so, that never solves the problem, does it? Has that ever worked for anybody because I said so? Anybody? Yeah? Good for you, Verena. Everyone else is like, she's got to be a saint or her kids are saints. My goodness. No. But for most of us, the because I said so isn't sufficient for a kid. Why do I have to do this? Because when you get older and I can't be here to protect you, I want you to learn the basic skills of how to live in the world. If my parents had told me that in hindsight, now I may not have changed at all, but if that had been the message that I had received, I'm doing this not because I hate you, not because I'm trying to make you into a specific person, but because I want to form within you the ability to develop a discipline, that would have gone a whole lot further for me than because I said so. My, my parents were perfectly fine. We didn't always get along. I love them now because I'm an adult and I realize I was a butt as a kid. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> but just that little nuance of how we speak to our children, not talk at them, can make a difference because in our world today, Satan is winning a lot of battles with our kids. And it started in the classroom with their friends, but also sometimes with their teachers occasionally, depending on what schools they go to. There are some school districts, I don't think in Oklahoma, but in other states, 
where the teachers are telling kids, don't tell your parents, it doesn't matter what, the, what, doesn't matter what it is. If your kid is told not to tell your parents anything, that is bad. Because as parent, it is your responsibility to know as much as you can about your children so that you can lead them away as much as you can from death, destruction, and damnation so that you can help bring them back. I'm not saying to read your daughter's diaries. I'm not saying to snoop in your kids' underwear drawers. But I also don't want you to be naive that kids are not being pressured to do things that our generation and older generations weren't and at a much, much younger age. Typically, once a year, we have a weekend that we call Safe Haven Sunday, where we talk about pornography and the evils of pornography and masturbation. Our kids, they're like, I don't know what that is. They don't know the terms. I remember in grade school, in fourth grade, someone finding a Playboy. Didn't know what I was looking at. It was a woman without clothes on. Didn't know what that meant. But that, that was as an eight and nine-year-old. The phones that these kids are using, think about some of the apps that you go on and the um, commercials that come up on there, the ads. If you see it as inappropriate for you, half of the apps that your kids are using are getting the same exact ads. Think about that for a second. Because what is the number one thing that most parents of really young children do earlier than they should? Give them technology to shut them up. Now, for us growing up, in my family, technology was a reward. You got to play video games if you got everything else done. Your chores are done, your homework is done, fine, go play video games, but only for a certain amount of time. Now we're living in a world where, and I'm not saying this is good or bad or indifferent, our kids are being encouraged to play video games because now you can get a college scholarship for it. Your kid's a state champ in video games. I failed out of college because of video games. I'm not joking. That was why I didn't go to class. Because I'd be up till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning playing my Nintendo, playing the Xbox, playing my PS2. That it distracted me from what really mattered. That our kids right now are such longing to be part of the world that they would rather watch someone play a video game online than actually do something that can help them grow. There's a reason that Twitch streams are the, like, like the place to be right now. Millions of people are watching kids play video games. And it's like, I, I don't get it. <laughs> if I'm going to play a video game, I want to play a video game. I'm not going to spend time watching you play a video game, but if you think about it, we do as adults. Our generations watching people play video games is watching sports. Because what are we doing? We're watching other people do things that we can't do ourselves. Think about it for a second. It's the same mentality. And they get just as riled up watching these people kill each other in video games as we do when LeBron James gets dunked on. Or at least I do because I'm not a LeBron fan, sorry. I was a Kobe Lakers fan. Some of you guys are LeBron fans, I'm sorry. It's okay. They won last night in overtime. But we get so wrapped up with what their thing is that we don't realize we have our own things that are the same exact thing, just a generation above them. Our parents, it would have been what they heard on the radio. Well, my parents would have been what they heard on the, well, my grandparents would have been what they heard on the radio. Deacon, you're not that old. But, but it's what, what they would have watched on, for us, like TGIF was like water cooler type stuff they were talking about when we were growing up. You guys all know what TGIF is? It's not just thank goodness it's Friday or the restaurant. It was the, the Friday night lineup on ABC with like, the old school, like, um, it's like Tim the Toolman Taylor, so it's all that come to mind. Um, Ho Home Improvement and um, Boy Meets World and things like that um, that we would talk about as kids growing up. But for our parents, some of those things were actually holistic that they watched. 
couple weeks ago, I referenced in a homily the Andy Griffith show. It's black and white. It's boring to me. I, 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 I can't do westerns. Even like the modern westerns, like cowboys versus aliens, it's like, it's a western with guns. Now I'm good. <laughs> but some people, that's where they find it. That's awesome. But for me, that was never something that really caught my attention. But for some other generations, it does. And so how do we then utilize the language that they speak to try and teach them something? There's a reason that I quote movies. There's a reason I quote TV shows. There's a reason I talk about sports. There's a reason I try and be as contemporary as I can with some of my references at Mass. Because sometimes you guys get the references. Like before class, I was talking with Josh and Katie about, there was a video that I saw this afternoon about, ah, our cartoons growing up, we knew what we were watching. We watched DuckTales and Tailspin and Gummy Bears and Darkwing Duck and, yeah, Tiny Toons and, yeah, that was the good old days. My parents were like, huh, we had Wacky Races, we had Bugs Bunny, we had um, Tom and Jerry, we had the Jetsons, we had the Flintstones. No, you're just in the Flintstone age, Mom and Dad. But that we all have our own generational thing that makes sense to us. So how do we then meet them where they are? Sometimes it means we have to engage things that make us feel uncomfortable. There's some TV shows that I morally don't want to watch, but I watch them some of them, to try and use something from that to teach our kids a positive lesson. Because I'm not naive to, say, to think that they aren't watching these things. Like, I use a Game of Thrones reference in high school to try and explain to kids the relationship between Abraham and God. They're like, okay, you, you got to break that apart for me, Father. Genesis chapter 15 Abraham is making this covenant with God. And Abraham is terrified in Genesis 15. Why? Because he's being called to make what's called a blood oath covenant. Where a liege lord, Game of Thrones terms, a liege lord would make an agreement with their banner man and say, if I, liege lord, do not uphold my side of this covenant... You can quite literally bathe in my blood. You can slip my throat and walk through my blood. Graphic. Yes, I understand. Genesis 15. And the banner man says, if I, as banner man, don't uphold my part of this covenant, you can slip my throat and bathe in my blood. That's the covenant that we see in Genesis 15, which is why Abraham is so terrified that he falls into a deep sleep. And in the midst of that, what happens a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke go through the blood that he sees in his dream. Why? Why does this even matter? Because what it is, is God is saying, I, as liege lord, take on myself both sides of this covenant. That whether you, banner man, or I, liege lord, break this covenant, my blood pays the price of the covenant the new and everlasting covenant. That it all begins to make sense when we use the terminology that we know. But sometimes that means we've got to look and find, okay, where are they using these different things? So it's easy to say, don't watch that, or don't look at that, or don't say that, or don't do that. But if we don't give them the why behind it, all we're being told is no. And typically our response to no ooh, I shouldn't be doing this. Why shouldn't I be doing this? And then our brains go to every imaginable bad place. Well, if they think I'm not old enough to do it, I'm going to prove to them that I am. How many times do we see that played out in our culture and in our families? So instead of saying, don't do that, saying, hey, what are you watching? Why are you watching that? What is it that you're seeking to learn from this? How is this helping you to grow? It's just mind-numbing. Hey, I got something over here that, that can, you can use mind-numbing that may not be quite as detrimental to your soul. How about we try that? And, and so, so using their logic and meeting them where they are sometimes can be a much better way of us evangelizing to our kids, but also the hardest part of evangelizing your kids is hypocrisy. Because at some point, 
your kid's going to call you a hypocrite. Because we are. I mean, we, we are hypocrites. The definition of a hypocrite is someone that says one thing and does the exact opposite. How many times have we told our kids not to do something and we do that very thing? I'll never forget my first summer assignment with a priest. The priest said, you will never make a good priest if your room is as messy as it is right now. I called him on it. I said, have you seen your car? Talk about uh, pot kettle. He said, do what I say, not what I do. And at that moment, I lost a little sliver of respect for him because he knew he was a hypocrite and he didn't care. And he was trying to teach me through his hypocrisy about how I was doing it wrong. I own up to being a hypocrite, not because I want to teach people through my hypocrisy, but because I'm trying to change my Hippocratic ways. Hypocritical ways. My Hippocratic, that's the oath for doctors. (laughs) My hypocritical way of sometimes teaching. I am a sinner. I recognize that. But I'm doing my damnedest and darndest to turn away from those sins. There's some days that I fall to temptation. There's some days where I don't have the energy. There's some days that I recognize what I'm saying, I'm not practicing what I'm preaching. But as a priest, my role is the same as yours as parents. I want to lead you and guide you the best I can. And sometimes that means saying something that I know that I'm not doing. Partly because I'm working on it myself and trying to figure out how do I get to this point in my own life But also, just like you are with your children, as God is with us, we see the errors before our kids do, right? You're like, no, don't do that. Oh, why did you do that? You could have avoided so much pain. It's the same way the Lord looks at us when we fall into temptation and sin. He doesn't love us any differently. He doesn't treat us any differently. He just doesn't want us to be in pain. And so how is it then that we can accompany one another? We'll come back in the fall and we'll figure... No, I'm just just kidding. (laughs) To be continued. Well, I mean, that's part of why I want to have the adult classes. Partly because my hope is in two years, you guys will be teaching. You knew that, right? Jill, you're going back next year. I haven't talked to you yet. It's happening. Two years. It's happening. Great couple to teach junior high kids. I'm just saying... And John Pierre's like, not me. You could teach in Spanish. (laughs) See, as for that. But I'm hoping to equip you guys as a priest with tools to just do the best that you can in your own lives, in your spouse's lives, in your kids' lives. Because as much as I care about your kids, I have to teach you. Because you are the best teachers that your kids will have. Outside of the classroom, they spend more time with you guys in the home than with anyone else. You get me 10 to 20 minutes on a good week (laughs) when I'm preaching. Same thing with Deacon. But that message is so short compared to the lives that they live with you. So if I can help give you ammo give you tools in your tool belt, we have the potential to change our church. But as I started this class back in August, September, and said, hey, man, we've got 15, 20 people in here. There's nine of us in here tonight. 200 kids down the hall. That ratio, unless you guys each have, do you guys have 20 kids? I mean, the Meisners, you guys are getting close. (laughs) But nobody here has 20 kids. And so it's incumbent upon us to say, how do we get our brothers and sisters, the other parents, to continue to be active in their own faith? Because I know most of us, myself included, we've fallen away from the faith at one point in our lives. But you're here tonight. And some of you guys are here online. But how do we continue to grow? One day at a time, one lesson at a time, one opportunity at a time. So I'm planning again in the fall to have these same classes at the same time as the kids, again, in hopes of continuing to grow our adult faith community, in hopes of trying to meet you where you are, 
So this summer, I'm going to have a couple emails I'm going to send out and a couple surveys to see what is it that you guys want to talk about. I can get up here and talk forever, as you just witnessed in the last hour, about anything and nothing all at the same time. But what things do you struggle with in life that I may be able to speak into, the deacon may be able to speak into? What things about the church are you seeking to grow in and understand better for yourself, for your work environment, for your family? Let me know what it is you want me to talk on, because I've got all summer to, to work on it. Okay? Let's end with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for this day, for this beautiful afternoon outside. We pray that you may continue to bless our families, that you may watch over these parents, that you may watch over their children, that you may help them to grow in faith, always seeking understanding, always seeking to grow deeper in love. We ask all these things through your mother's intercessions, we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Don't worry, I wasn't going to sing it. See you guys.